Hi. So uh, my name is Ben Obergfell. I work at the New York Times on the uh, crossword puzzle app. Um, you'll find me on Twitter. Uh, my handle there is Ben Likes to Code. Um, there we go. Uh, one of the things that really uh, makes you feel good about seeing people use your app on the subway is for one thing, it means everyone, everyone of all watts of life likes to use their product. The other thing is that you end up finding out that they actually get some value out of the app when it's running offline, and that's kind of feel, you know feels good too. So um, a little bit, oops. A little bit about myself, uh, I'm an Android engineer on the Crossword team at the New York Times. Um, before that, I used to work at American Express on the mobile app there, and I did some work for Jive Software on their social business platform, or their uh, Android app before. Um, and before I discovered Android, I used to work on uh, cancer research uh, data pipelines and the Human Genome Project. Um, but here at the Times, much of our Crossword game can be enjoyed offline. And we learned some lessons along the way, uh, how, to, how we got there. And some of this is demonstrated in an open source app that I've put together here on GitHub uh, that we'll be kind of walking through. So much of working offline involves uh, using intelligent caching. Caching is great, but not all of your data are created equally. So it's important to know thy data. So there's data that your app revolves around. You have things like contact lists, game boards, your progress may be through a game, you have favorites and bookmarks, chat conversations. These things are all core to your business logic and are very important to persist and keep around. Other parts of your data models may be ephemeral. ephemeral. These are things like search results, activity streams, news articles, um, to quote that great line from Blade Runner, all of these moments will just be lost in time, light tears and rain. They still matter though to your user as they're working their way through their app. It's just not something that you're gonna keep around for the long term. A real world example here would be uh, the home screen of our crossword puzzle app. We have an API of course for fetching the puzzles so that you can go and play them. We also have an API to fetch this landing screen at the, uh, that you see when you open the app. And this has the featured puzzles for the day, and then also maybe some uh, in-app purchase packs that you might want to buy. Whatever we want to promote, we'll put it up on the featured screen. This data is ephemeral. Do we really need a normalized data model to save this? And one way or another, our UI really shouldn't have to care how the data is actually brought to the forefront. So let's take a look at our demo app here. Uh, let me play the video. So we have a video uh, of an app here with a feed of cats. And you can lawn press and uh, save a cat to adopt it in your home. And uh, you know, we'll go ahead and browse through some cat pictures. We'll save another one here. And then we'll go and look at our list of cats that we favorited. And then we can also go back and do a pull to refresh and get a whole new batch of cats. And if you open this app offline, you'll get a set of cats to look at, even if it's your very first time. And you can still even long click on them and uh, save them to your bookmarks. So what this kind of presents in the, uh, the demo app is kind of a use of a repository pattern. So why a repository? Uh, your presenter and your UI logic can be agnostic to all the inside baseball about getting the data. It can be easily mocked out when you're testing, and so that you can pass new data forward uh, in you know, an espresso test or something like that. Rotation is made easy because you can retain the repository, but not the presenter that you have that's actually orchestrating the uh, UI elements. So when you rotate the screen, your activity recreates, you pull back your cache data, and you save yourself a network call. And then it also applies some simplicity to your uh, logic for getting with data. So we have actually got at the New York Times an open source library called Store that helps to uh, give you kind of a, a way of 
implementing a repository around that sort of ephemeral data. So what store is, it's a take on the repository pattern. And like I said, it isolates you from the nitty gritty details of how the underlying data is accessed. Uh, store gives you a unidirectional data flow, so things inbound from a, a back end, things like the featured screen or news articles, for instance. It composes an API call to a back end, in memory caching, disk caching, and parsing from a network flow to your uh, data model objects. No matter what parser you like to use, JSON, Moshi, Jackson, uh, we got you covered there. Um, you're able to address data in the cache with this concept called a barcode. And so a barcode is a type and a key that can identify uh, a data type that you're gonna go and cache, and then also pass parameters forward into uh, your fetching logic if you like. So for instance, maybe we were building a Reddit client and we wanted to model uh, the feed from a subreddit. We might have a type called Reddit posts and we might pass the uh, subreddit name as the, uh, the key. And all of this has a nice RxJava bow tied around it. So the store gives you uh, two primary methods. One is a git, one is a fetch. So a fetch is gonna go to the network, get data, cache it, and return it. A git is gonna look at your local cache, and either fetch if it's stale or give you back cache data. And as the network response comes in, it's streamed straight to disk as well as given back to you uh, after it's been fed through your parser. So how do we build a store? Um, let's take a look at maybe a retrofit uh, interface declaration here. So if you've used retrofit before, you might be used to seeing the type that you're using, uh, you're getting back here might be a, uh, a model object and you're actually using a, a type adapter uh, plugged into retrofit to get back deserialized uh, data. With store, we're gonna actually capture a response body, which is an OK HTTP type that represents the raw bytes of the response. And so that's how we capture the, the data stream uh, from your network service. Meanwhile then, you can actually build the store, and let me grab the, uh... so you have a store builder, and you uh, set up your, uh, we're gonna have a barcode, which is gonna be the key for our store, a buffered source, which is the uh, OKHTP uh, response source, and then cat response, which is actually the deserialized data type that we wanna get back uh, from the store. So you give it three things here, a fetcher, a persister, and a parser. So the fetcher round here is going to go ahead and actually call the, uh, the fetch method on our API that we just looked at in the last slide. And then it's going to grab the source out of the response body, which is this buffered source. And that's all OK, OK HTTP doing that. That's work there. Then we're gonna chain it into the persister. And one thing you get for free from uh, the store is a factory for creating a persister that will save things to disk. So we can give it the uh, cache directory from uh, our Android uh, application instance, and then we can actually pass in a cache policy for expiration time. So if we want to expire out our cat feed at uh, one hour, we can give that there. You also get a factory here for your parser, so we're gonna go ahead and create a JSON, new up a JSON, and uh, say that we want our cat response to come back and that be the deserialized type. Um, again, this is where you could, you know, if you're used to using Jackson or Moshi, you can plug those in here. So then once we have the store, how do we use it? So um, there's again two methods here, git and fetch. So this is like a little snippet of our uh, presenter here. So maybe we'll get for a barcode, and then we'll subscribe on that response, and add those to our little internal list that backs the recycle view, and call our view did load method. Uh, you know, if there's an error, we can go and log it. And what this will do is if there's cached data, it'll return it. 
Otherwise, it'll do a fetch and give you that. Say you have a pull to refresh, you can go and call fetch. It's that same interface other than uh, git versus fetch. So if you take a look at the underlying file system from uh, what we get here, and this is in the Android Studio Device Explorer, by default, the, the data on the file system is essentially just stored in a file with the uh, Java 2 string of your barcode. Um, you can change that, though, with something we call a path resolver. And so if you want to go and have something fancier in your file system, we can go and define a path resolver. So for instance here, maybe you want to just have barcode uh, type dot and the key. So maybe this might be cat pictures dot all cats. And then we can go and pass forward our path resolver into the uh, persister here. And there's a slightly different uh, interface here for creating a file system persister that takes a uh, path resolver uh, called the file system persister factory. You give it that, and it's going to go ahead and use that uh, path resolver to, to figure out what file to actually use on the file system. This is going to come in handy for uh, something I'm going to come into later in the talk. But we go ahead and uh, implement that, and we look at our data uh, on the app, and we're not using a two-string anymore. So when you look at like the architecture of our fragment that actually renders the UI and the presenter. So uh, we have a cat fragment that represents the data under the list of uh, the cat tab. And then we have a presenter here that uh, orchestrates all the UI. And we're injecting this using dagger, and this lives within this, the fragment scope. So when you rotate the uh, phone, and it destroys the activity and recreates it, and recreates the fragment, it's going to recreate the presenter. In our presenter, we're going to go and inject the store. And the store would live, if we go back to our uh, example here, we declare this with the singleton scope and dagger so that this lives outside of the presenter scope. And so it's kept the law inside when you uh, destroy the activity so that when this gets new back up, it gives you back your uh, store right there on the spot. So what this means is that when you go and rotate the phone, you're able to immediately get back to your cache data, and uh, it's back off to the races. So how do we handle uh, more permanent data? This is something where you might want to uh, consolidate that access into a repository interface of your own. So a likely code path to that would be Decide how fresh your local data is, return that value, execute a network fetch, and merge the local data, and give it back. And that git and fetch distinction is important because if you're uh, coming up offline, you don't want to fetch and get nothing because there's nothing to see. Um, for instance, we have the list of puzzles you see in the archive screen of our app that has all your past progress. And that's something we don't want to save with the store because it's not ephemeral data. So we have some logic where we kind of fetch your progress and merge it with local, figure out um, does the back end think that you're further along in the game than we think locally? We don't want to stomp on your local data if you have progress that's unsaved. And so that's kind of the logic we have there. Um, that's always something that really matters to your own uh, individual data model. So. One thing we don't want to see when you open your app is nothing. You know, we don't want someone to go and download our crossword app and then go to the subway and think, I'm kind of bored. Um, I downloaded that crossword app. You open it up and there's nothing there. And they come back when they, you know, they have a chance and they one star us and it's no fun. So how can we mitigate this risk? So, Suppose we have a, a preloaded response here of our cat data. So we have an, uh, you know, an ID and the image URL, and these are things that would come back from the back end. Um, what we can do is rather than have a URL to a live resource on the web, 
is we can provide a, an Android asset resource. So these URLs here are actually usable in uh, you know, Picasso or a web view, and you can bundle them right into your asset directory in your project. So these get all bundled up. The Android toolchain will put them all in a zip file. And then when you try and use them from the uh, asset manager, it would go and index in a zip file and pluck them out. So how can we leverage this? Um, what you can do in our on create is we can actually apply our, uh, our canned data for the first load. So this is where that path re resolver comes back into play. So you know, we can use a shared pref here to make sure that we only want to apply the canned data on your very first load. We don't want to overwrite your cache the next time you come into the app if you have real and new data. We can take our barcode for what we want to warm up the cache for, uh, pull in an asset for that local data, and then use the path resolver to figure out what file represents that piece of cache data. And then go ahead and write that in and stomp on our preference to say, don't do it again. So yeah, there's our path resolver helping us know where to dump the file. So um, another thing that you can do is use the data that you have to your advantage and uh, your own individual cases to help you out uh, with offline. So when does your data change? You might be able to do a push notification when server data changes. If your user is offline, the push will land when they are back on network, and it can do a, f a fetch to freshen the data back up. You can use something like Job Scheduler or Firebase uh, Job Dispatcher to go and schedule friendly background syncs. So one thing that would be handy is after you make some sort of progress in your app, or you know, maybe you save your, a record that you want to sync up, you can go and create a scheduled job to save it. And if you have network, it'll go right through. Otherwise, when you go uh, back into network access, uh, it will wake up and fire that job. The uh, Firebase Job Dispatcher is actually what uh, Google rep recommends because it, in, uh, it uses the same interface as Job Scheduler, but they've backported a bunch of fixes and it's supported all the way back to, I believe, API 14. Um, the Job Scheduler is only a thing from uh, Lollipop forward and there were uh, bugs in Job Scheduler going up to about uh, Marshmallow. So, They've backported fixes to uh, older versions that had the job scheduler, and they've backported it to versions that didn't have it at all. Um, the caveat with the Firebase Job Dispatcher is that if you're publishing to like the Amazon uh, Kindle Store or you're otherwise not wanting to lean on Google Play services, uh, that's not going to be an option for you. I know that Evernote has a uh, a version of the they have a job dispatcher that also has like three different uh, code paths, one for using the uh, job scheduler that's built in, one for using Firebase Job Dispatcher, and if you have nothing, it gives you some uh, alarm manager hooks under the scenes that actually let you mimic uh, the same sort of setup. So one thing we do, is every, uh, every day we post tomorrow's puzzle. So today being Wednesday, we'll post Thursday's puzzle at uh, 10 p.m. New York time. And on weekends, we do it at 6 uh, p.m. New York time. Users can register for push notifications, and we give them a nice little prompt here right when the puzzle's ready to play. Under the hood, when a puzzle push comes in, uh, we help our solver out by prefetching it. And we also refresh this archive view data so that it's right there, in the, uh, right there so they can browse to it. So when they go and play that game on the subway the next morning, it's there ready to go. And no need to go and wait to download it when you don't have network. One thing we do uh, at the Newsreader app is they use a job scheduler to refresh the latest news. 
This forms up a store that has all the archive uh, article data, runs at 6 a.m. and 4 p.m. So it freshens a reader's cache before their morning and their evening subway commutes, which is pretty clever. So one thing that people have asked me before is, uh, what do you want to use a sync adapter or a job scheduler for this kind of thing? Um, sync adapters give you battery-friendly, uh, network-aware background syncing, but they come with all this extra overhead of having to set up an account and a content provider. And you can do this and, p and provide dummy implementations for these things, but it's just a bunch of boilerplate that you don't necessarily need. I said job scheduler lives in API 21. Firebase Job Dispatcher works uh, API 9, uh, uh, but needs Google Play services. So your non-Google device is below API 21, and some of those Amazon devices are kind of straddle that boundary. Uh, some of the older ones are stuck on KitKat. Some of the newer ones actually ship with Lollipop. Either way, you get a service context in which to run your sync logic, which is really kind of nice, because you get a self-contained place to run it. Um, so it's easy to actually, if you were using a sync adapter before, you can migrate to a job scheduler without uh, too much work. Just kind of take that service and change the interface. So um, with that, uh, I kind of point out the URL for the store and our demo app, which is on GitHub. And there's me on Twitter and uh, I'll open the floor for uh, questions. All right, thank you.